it's something that those critics will maybe never see for themselves and wouldn't know how to respect if they did, which is the unconditional and enormous love that binds us together in this new family. The last time Secretary Pete Buttigieg and I spoke at length was the summer of 2020. With his historic presidential campaign in the rear view, he spoke optimistically about the future of this country and expressed a desire to continue to serve it. Back then, he was still Mayor Pete. And in a lot of ways, he always will be. But Secretary Buttigieg is a different person from the one the nation first met. Fatherhood can do that to a man. So can politics. And unfortunately for Secretary Buttigieg and his husband Chaston, those two worlds merged into one almost as soon as their children were born. That was just in 2021. And while one would think the anti-LGBTQ rhetoric aimed at the couple would be a thing of the past, here it is 2023, and former Vice President and presumed 2024 presidential candidate Mike Pence decides to rehash some old homophobic and sexist remarks about Secretary Buttigieg taking paternity leave. The criticism was swift, starting with the Biden administration calling on Pence to apologize. Of course, not only has he not apologized, he later accuses the secretary of not being able to take a joke, as if being a father in the hospital as your newborn twins are fighting to survive is somehow funny. Chaston responded quickly on social media as well as television, like this appearance from ABC's The View. But the thing about what he said is it flies in the face of what he says he is. He says he's a family values yeah, right. Republican. Well, and, a, and a faithful one. Yes, yeah, so I don't think Filled he's practicing pain. what he preaches no. here, yeah. but it's yeah. part of a much bigger trend, mm-hmm. I think, attacking families. And it wasn't just about attacking the LGBTQ community because someone wrote this and he checked it and then purposely said maternity leave rather than paternity leave, but also... Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a bigger conversation about the work that women do in families, right? Taking a swipe at all women yeah. mm-hmm. in all families all. and expecting that women would stay at home and raise children, I think, is a pretty misogynistic view, especially from a man who just last year mm-hmm. said that we should be supporting more people who adopt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, the criticism came from many corners. However, we have not heard much about the matter from Secretary Buttigieg himself, who has been dealing with the fallout from the train derailment in Ohio, a rash of near misses at our airports, and the recent Senate hearing regarding his agency's 2024 budget request. In short, he's been busy. Which is why we're grateful he made some time for us at Life Out Loud to not only address his latest dust up with Pence, who was governor of Indiana while Pete was mayor of South Bend, but also the journey to parenthood and what he's learned since becoming a father. I don't need to remind any of you about the hundreds of anti-LGBTQ bills that are out there. Some seek to ban gender-affirming care, Others, discussions about sexual orientation in the classroom, which will make teaching about historic figures, like his Secretary Buttigieg, complicated. Which, I guess, is the point. Unfortunately, because of his schedule, we had less time with him than we would have liked. In the end, my hope is that you not only hear the love that the Secretary has for his family, but also further understand why we dedicated this entire season of Life Out Loud to the various ways families are formed. These anti-LGBTQ bills, these laws targeting trans youth and their parents, they are more than just political calculations. They impact the tone of our culture and impact real people. Children, like Joseph August Buttigieg and his sister, Penelope Rose. Not yet two, and yet sadly, already a part of politics, if that's what we want to call it. As you know, this entire season is on family and family as it pertains to our community. And the season starts off with a conversation between my son and I, who's now 26. And through the course, we talk about all the different ways in which our community has family, grows their families, etc. Do you remember where you were when you discovered that you and Chastin were indeed going to be dads? (laughs) Yeah, so Chaston and I became dads on about 24 hours notice. We had been on a list for adoption for probably about a year. 
like a lot of parents hoping to adopt, we'd had a couple of false starts, had our hearts broken a couple of times. What do those false starts look like? You know, you, you get a call. Sometimes you even get a call and you get a, a very specific uh, kind of description of a uh, uh, mom who's making an adoption plan. Uh, sometimes a surprise, so-called surprise scenario where she's given birth and is d- deciding what to do next. And sometimes you're, you're gearing up and about to get your bags packed and then you find out that it's fallen through. And this is something that so many people who've, who've grown their families through adoption have experienced. And we had our fair share of that. And so by the time the call really did come, you know, uh, there was a part of me that wasn't totally sure whether this one was, was real. But within a few hours, it was, it was clear that it was. Uh, I was on a trip. I was traveling to the Southwest, uh, part of my, my job as secretary. And uh, uh, Chaston called. There were a lot of people around, so I, I sort of gave short um, yes or no answers to the questions he was asking as, as uh, we were talking about it. And then once we landed, I, I called him back, and we talked about it a little more. And later that night, I was on a red eye um, back to uh, uh, get me to the small rural hospital where uh, uh, he and I converged. And uh, the next day, we were holding him in our arms. I mean, it really was that quick. Um, and of course, along the way, learned that uh, that the adoption opportunity was uh, twins, <laughs> that they were premature, that there were some other things we needed to think about, some some uh, uh, challenges that, that came with that scenario, but also this incredible uh, moment and this incredible chance that that we would uh, suddenly uh, go from a, a married couple to a family of four. When you talked about the false starts and how, when you got the last call, that you were just sort of like. I guess, guarding your heart a little bit because it had been broken multiple times. Mm. Um, when did you know that it was okay to open up and really embrace this moment? What was the clue that this one was real? Well, the moment we saw them, everything changed. Uh, it's one thing to be told that, that this is, is going to work out. Uh, it's another to actually see them. Uh, you know, both of us walked into that, that hospital room. Uh, you know, uh, they'd been born for a matter of hours and, uh, and they were sleeping, both of them. Um, and we, I think we both uh, just broke down and, and, and were so full of joy the moment we saw them. But uh, of course, adoption processes aren't, aren't simple. And so there were weeks after that before we actually got the adoption finalized. And that led to a whole set of conversations about uh, how and when to tell people uh, how much we were comfortable with uh, uh, with the public knowing. Uh, on one hand, we're excited to share our news and wanted to make sure that that it was clear why I was you know, stepping back a little bit from uh, being on TV all the time and out and about every day the way people were used to me being. And on the other hand, not wanting to do anything that could complicate or jeopardize the process of getting it finalized until the moment we went before uh, a judge. Uh, uh, virtually, um, as so many things played out in, in 2021, we, we had a Zoom uh, hearing from our uh, kitchen at our house in Traverse City, sitting at our kitchen table with them as it finally got uh, totally finalized. And I think that moment, up until that moment, that was some, I don't know, six weeks or so after they were born, um, that was when we could really breathe easy and know that this was definitely going to be our future and that this was unquestionably our our family now in every legal and uh, moral and, and and human sense of the term. I just want to walk back a little bit and just sort of peel back the timeline just so listeners have a better sense of what you and Chaston were both under and, and the rest of your family as well. Because I mean, when you bring in life into the world, there's grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins and the whole nine, and they're all holding their breath. From the point in which your children were born to the point in which the adoption was finalized, you're saying that was a six weeks process? Uh, maybe a little longer than that, but yeah, roughly. Uh, uh, that's okay. that's how it worked out. It, it started with, uh, of course, going to the hospital, uh, seeing them for the first time. And then because they were born a little early, they weren't ready to leave the hospital. They uh, each needed extra care for, for different reasons, which meant... Uh, a couple of weeks where we didn't really leave the hospital either. Uh, we were all in that room. So we're uh, at, at various times, Chaston's parents uh, and my mom. And in, in a way, uh, even though that was challenging, because of course, like any new parents, we wanted to get them home as quickly as possible. 
We also benefited from being able to see how different nurses would give advice on how to uh, swaddle them and fold a swaddling blanket and how to give them the right uh, the right kind of care, how to give them a bath, what to do when uh, it didn't seem like they were taking the bottle the way they needed to be. All, all the things that, that, that we uh, needed to learn for them in order to be able to take care of them. And then finally the day came when they were cleared to go. We got them in those uh, uh, little car seats and uh, and, and pretty soon had them uh, home in Michigan. Uh, and then in, in, in those weeks, uh, especially the first few weeks when uh, I was on a paternity leave that, that allowed me something that federal workers now have, but most Americans don't, but allowed me the time with Chaston to, to really prepare our family and our household, especially because this did, did happen on 24 hours notice. And to the extent we were planning for a, a child, we were planning for one child. <laughs> um, and so everything from getting the gear to just, you know, knowing all the ways that our, our lives were going to change. Of course, it's a ton of work. I'm, I'm used to very, very hard work from serving as a mayor to this job to running for president to uh, be on deployment in the military, but uh, never like this, where uh, once we realized that what we really needed was a, a shift system so that uh, each of us could get at least a little bit of sleep. Um, my day started at, at 3 a.m. Uh, somewhere between 2 and 3, he would tap out and crawl into bed, and it would be my turn. And <laughs> because of some of the things that, that uh, were going on with our kids, especially our daughter, who early on uh, had a condition where you couldn't, uh, she couldn't lay down for a long time after feeding, really meant that one of us had to be up with, uh, uh, with them much of the time or, or most of the time. But we had the, the space to figure that out. And then as uh, I began resuming more and more uh, uh, work, uh, first remotely and then uh, beginning to, to uh, go to Washington again, um, that was when we had another setback, which was that uh, uh, they were hospitalized with RSV. Uh, this is a, a virus that, that affects uh, a lot of people. You and I get it to just be a bad cold, usually. Um, but it can be lethal, for, uh, especially for little kids, especially for, for premature infants. It sent both of them to the hospital and uh, eventually landed our, our son in uh, intensive care fighting for his life on a ventilator. And so just at the time when we, we thought we were going to be getting things to normal, getting them to, to D.C., starting our new lives, uh, we had to, to, to get through that. But, uh, but thank God we did. He did. Uh, pulled through. And, uh, and by uh, later on that fall, uh, we're setting up our new life uh, as a family of four plus two dogs. Uh, under one roof in Washington, and uh, like all working parents, after that uh, huge change, com- change comes to your life, uh, figuring out uh, what that meant for us and uh, how to do right by our responsibilities outside the home and our responsibilities to our, uh, our our two new amazing beautiful children. Absolutely, as, as I told you earlier, you know I, I too am a father, and I find in my life that the best days of my life, as well as the worst days of my life, are both connected to being a father. <laughs> um, the, 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 the best days, I think, are pretty obvious. True. But so I want to share something with you about the worst day, because I think it's something you maybe identify with. Hmm. I was in graduate school. At the time, I was still married to my ex-wife. And so she also was in graduate school. We both were graduate assistants. And we had this you know, one-and-a-half-year-old child uh, while we were in school. And he had contracted a virus hmm. and it forced him to be in the hospital for about 48 hours overnight. And, you know, I'm not comparing our situation, obviously, to what you and Chaston went through. But it taught me right away about the fragility of life, what was required of me. But it also showed me just how powerless I was. Hmm. That was really nothing I could do but just be there for my son and seeing him with the you know, the IV and all of that, like it really, yeah. like, I can't get that vision out of my head. And so I guess my question to yeah. you, you know, would be understanding everything that you went through, everything that your family went through. What is it like to hear people say disparaging things about your family? I know for me, uh, when someone came for my son, I tore his head off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious, how are you and Chaston dealing with yeah. being in the focus of these attacks with that background? Yeah. Well, first of all, I know exactly that feeling you're describing, and I, I remember it. Uh, you know, one thing you notice when you have children is how completely dependent they are on you. But another thing you begin to discover is how dependent you are uh, on others. And, and when you're encountering the healthcare system, uh, even from the very fortunate position that, 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 that we did, having good health insurance and, and, and seeing our kids get, get very good care, 
uh, you you realize how much really is out of your control, especially when you have a tiny, you know, weeks old child fighting for his life. Uh, and you realize in those moments what what really matters and who you really count on. And we would not have got through that time if it weren't for friends and family who were there for us, not just emotionally, but just in very basic, practical ways, helping us figure out the logistics of me looking after our daughter while Chaston was in the ICU room with our son and then switching places and making sure somebody was uh, with them at all times. And I think because of that, to get to your question, maybe the attacks didn't get to me they would have if I weren't being daily reminded of, of, of what was so important. Don't get me wrong. It is galling for people, especially people who go on television talking about family values. Uh, and then when your actual family is, uh, is struggling, they uh, use it as a, as a way to attack you or as a political football. Uh, don't get me wrong. That, that definitely <laughs> gets to you at some level. But at another level, you realize that that's just politics. And when you're face to face with, with uh, a life or death struggle involving your child and that comes out okay. It becomes less important to you that the political game comes out okay, uh, because if if you got to choose between one of those things working out, it's an easy choice. The thing you want and need most to work out is the well-being of your family, and it allows you to remember that that, that so much of the rest is is noise. It doesn't make it okay, and there are different ways uh, in the political and the policy space that that so many families are under attack right now. And yet, when you can put it in, in that kind of perspective, uh, at least in, in our journey, in our path, it, uh, uh, it was one of the many ways that, that having kids gives you a healthy reality check on, on what matters most in life. You know, you are so right, because, you know, let's go ahead and talk about the elephant that's in the room. You know, Vice President Pence obviously has said some disparaging remarks about, about you, about your family. and rehash some old jokes and is con- trying to continue this criticism on mm. the media in various different ways. And you, you hadn't really talked about it much. And I, I guess what you're suggesting is that what you just didn't think it was worth your time, <laughs> I guess, or not worth the investment of, of, of a response because you were very focused in on, on your family. Yeah, kind of, especially when, especially when these things are a play for attention. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, when when somebody's doing stuff like that in order to get attention, especially for the purposes of presidential politics, and we come home and, you know, we know what matters most. I mean, don't get me wrong. We'll stick up for our family. Chaston has stuck up uh, for our family in amazing ways. Uh, but the last thing you want to do is is uh, reward that kind of thing with with your attention. I think the best answer to a lot of these attacks and, and a lot of this meanness that's out there the best answer is to be a thriving family or to do everything you can to be a thriving family. I mean, the best answer to people out there who don't even think we count as a real family <laughs> is the love and the, the beauty of our family itself. It's not a zinger. It's, it's not a tweet. It's something that those critics will maybe never see for themselves and wouldn't know how to respect if they did which is the unconditional and enormous love that binds us together in this new family that gives a different kind of meaning to my life and that is the foundation for our two children now a year and a half old and growing to continue to grow and to continue to thrive and and, um, they're the best answer i have to uh, so many of the uncertainties and, and, and and so much of the ugliness that's out there in the world, the political world and, 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 and everything that comes with it. What has surprised you most about being a dad? You know, everyone has these ideas about what it's going to be like. You get advice, you might read yeah. some books. You strike me as someone who may have read some re- books and researched ahead of time. And then you get the job, right? <laughs> <laughs> what surprised you? Yeah, there's no, there's no owner's manual for this, right? <laughs> Not at I all. I think the, the never-ending nature of it It had been described to me, but I didn't really understand it. I think that, you know, if you try to tell somebody why it's so demanding to 
to chase toddlers around or to uh, look after them, make sure they're fed. It, it doesn't sound as hard as it is, I think, because it, it, it's not the fact of it in any given moment that makes it so demanding. It's the commitment that comes with it. It's the fact that uh, every moment you are responsible for the well-being of, of your children. And that's a feeling that, that can fill you with purpose, uh, and it can also wear you out. And, and there's no amount of reading and writing that can, that can really help you understand that. Another thing that, that I didn't fully understand was just how physical parenting is. I mean, just the picking them up and putting them down and getting them changed and, 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 and the feeding and the running around, maybe that'll get a little simpler. when. They're... Oh, come on. You were, you were in the military. Yeah, and that's the thing. So I thought I knew, you know, and I've worked out a lot. I, I thought I was very comfortable with that sort of thing. But it's just different when, when you got moving targets, when they, they get – more and more sophisticated, evasive maneuvers at bath time and when you're trying to change them and when you're trying to keep them eating their food. Um, it, it, it just, uh, I don't know, it requires something different from you. And the other thing that, that I think I learned gradually is that there's no question of getting your old life back and you shouldn't even want that. But it takes a while. At first you think, well, once they're sleeping through the night, then, then life will be a little more like normal. Or, you know, once they can walk on their own, I don't have to carry them everywhere, that things will be a little more like normal. Once they start in daycare, things will be a little more like normal. And maybe that's partly true. But what's more true is that your old life isn't coming back. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it for a minute, you'd never want it to. You just have a new equation now. And things matter in a different way. And the things that you used to, to love to do, they just fit in in a different way if they fit in at all. And there's new things that you love to do. And I think the hard part, especially if you're busy and, 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 and life is demanding, is to stop and remember that, that the, the work of raising children isn't, isn't work that you just get through and get to some finishing line or finished product that's like, okay, I put in all the work and now the, 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 the kid is, 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 you know, done and ready. And ready. <laughs> it's, it's the, the work is what matters so much. I thought about it just in the bath the other day. I'm always, uh, uh, you know, one, one of my part, part of where the division of labor falls to me is, is bath time. And, uh, and that's, that's a messy, splashy affair when you got two toddlers. <laughs> Are you a bubbles guy? Is this a bubble bath that's happening? We, we do the bubbles. The problem with bubbles is, of course, yeah, but then you got to rinse them off when you're getting them out of the tub. It, it's extra work. But I think it's, we think it's worth it. Chaston's very pro bubbles and I'm, I'm, I'm on board with it now. Um, <laughs> And they got the bubbles, they got their little floating foam alphabet letters in there. They got this, this kind of uh, cup or jug in the shape of a whale that I can pour the water over, over them to wash their hair. And, and while I'm doing all that, you know, there are moments where if you're not careful to, to be present and to be conscious, it just, just feels like work because it is work. I mean, just like cooking and cleaning for, for, for kids and getting them dressed and doing laundry and all that's work. But, but when you're with them, and I thought about this as I was just pouring out a cup of water to keep them entertained and saw the absolute joy in them as they just looked up at something as simple as a little stream of water coming out of a cup held over their eyes mm -hmm. or held over their eye level. Um, you, you realize that that's, that's not some moment you get through in order to get back to your day. That, that's life. That's living right there is to see the wonder of a small child at something as simple as how water pours out of a cup. And to let that be all there is for a minute before you get on to whatever your next task is, like, uh, uh, you know, getting them ready for bed. And when you see it that way, it allows you to really change your understanding of what time even is and what, what you're doing <laughs> with your life. So one of the things that uh, it was a reoccurring theme this season, um, but particularly during the episode with a friend of mine, Brian Vahaley, who's a former uh, HP uh, tennis player, is that parenting never stops. Like you never just stop being a mom or a dad ever. In fact, last night, and I swear to God, my son and I were both in bed mm -hmm. FaceTiming because he just wanted to talk about some things. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I don't know, maybe like midnight or something <laughs> like that. And he's like 26, right? So... My, my question to you is, because parenting never stops, mm -hmm. that means that care won't ever stop, that concern won't ever stop. You're a public figure. You both are. You and Chaston both are. The attacks, because of where you are, may never stop as well. Have you guys talked about how you're planning on handling conversations with your children as they get older and become more aware of these attacks, particularly on social media? Yeah, we, we think about that. We worry about that. 
uh, it hasn't caught up to them yet because they're you know wonderful, boisterous, nineteen months uh, old, and, and and that's not on their mind. But you know, anyone in public life uh, can uh, will, will have to face this, and and the, the cruelty of it is that uh, uh, you know when you're in public service, you've you've made a, a set of decisions, uh, but others who didn't make that decision are still wrapped up in it. Uh, and, you know, that's part of why it's so important if, if you're married to have a supportive spouse who uh, is, is, is part of that and is ready to take on some of the burdens that, that, uh, that they didn't necessarily ask for, um, but that, um, that, that you really turn to them uh, to help you shoulder. Uh, and it's even uh, more pressing when, when it comes to kids. And I don't think there's any easy answers, uh, although uh, I think that there, there are things you can do to try, to try to protect your kids, as we all do, try to protect our kids from whatever forces could affect them, um, and to equip them to understand that they're entering a world that, that isn't always fair, that, that isn't always going to treat them uh, based on what's in their heart uh, or, um, uh, or, or who they are, but, but sometimes based on, on things that shouldn't even enter into it. And who knows? You know, I think this is scary for anybody with, with kids this little looking to the future. Who knows 5, 10, 15 years from now where we're going to be with things like social media. Now, my hope is we all as a society will have become smarter about how to handle these digital ways of getting information that they don't consume us and that they bring out more of what is better in us and less of what is worse. We're clearly a long way from that. But I will say with, with every form of communication from the printing press on, you know, our society has become smarter over time about how not to, how not to let it deceive us uh, un, unwittingly or un, unthinkingly. And I hope that that'll be true. You think? I think so. I mean, I think... <laughs> you're, you're more optimistic than I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the way I think of it. Like, if if, some, if it was the 17th century and somebody handed you a pamphlet printed on a printing press, you probably would have thought, like, well, yeah, this has got to be legit. I mean, they have a printing press, right? Like this, is, and then over time, you learn, you know, you don't trust everything that you read. Uh, we all kind of know, without being able to explain how we know, at a glance, the difference between a news article in a newspaper and a full-page ad designed to look like a news article in that same newspaper. And with TV, you know, we learned over time kind of what to take more serious. Most of us, most of the time, I think, have learned, you know, to take some things on TV more seriously than others. And I think eventually we'll get more savvy about the digital space, too. But um, there's no avoiding the fact that, that when you have the, the amplification that comes with digital uh, tools and you combine that with the negativity that comes with public life and politics, it could be a really toxic brew. And again, it's one thing if you're someone like me who signed up for this, chose uh, to take on these these jobs and responsibilities because uh, because I believe the chance to do good is worth all of the the negativity that can come with it. It's another thing for a child who had no choice of their own about the matter and making sure they're going to be okay and they're going to be safe. Um, but I think every day about how to make sure that uh, you know whether I'm still in public life when they're old enough to ask me about it or not. That in these moments with this job that I do have, uh, that, that the way I do it is something I'd be proud to tell them about later on. Secretary Buttigieg, thank you. I'm not sure. Are you still going by Mayor Pete in some circles? <laughs> I'll always answer to Mayor Pete. <laughs> <laughs> well, then for old time's sakes, then Mayor Pete, thank you so much for your time, uh, for sharing so much of your family story with us. We at Life Allowed really appreciate it. And, and thank you so much for just being a proud and, and upstanding member of the LGBT plus community. Well, thank you. And thanks for giving this voice to families and, uh, uh, and parents who, uh, whose stories deserve to be told. And I'm glad you're, uh, you're paying attention to this. And we're proud to be part of that community.